Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Daily Homeroom live stream, which is something that all of us at Khan Academy started up once we started having uh, mass school physical closures, I should say, uh, many, now seems like a lifetime ago. It's just a way to keep in touch, have interesting conversations, and understand what's happening in the world around us in education and beyond. Uh, before we get into the conversation with uh, a very exciting guest today, I always give the reminder to folks that Khan Academy is a not-for-profit organization with a mission of providing a free world-class education for anyone, anywhere. And we exist because of philanthropic donations. So if you're in a position to do so, please think about donating. I want to give a special shout out to several corporate partners who've stepped up, especially because of our COVID response. Uh, you can imagine our traffic is almost three times what it typically is. Our costs are going up. We're trying to put more programs out there sooner than later. And so special thanks to Bank of America, Google.org, Novartis, AT&T, Fastly uh, for stepping up and for the many other supporters for Khan Academy over the years. We would not be able to do what we're doing now if not for the many years of support. And uh, we're still running at a deficit. And so whether you're a corporate partner or even a small donor who can give $3, $5, uh, everything makes a difference so that we can continue to uh, accelerate uh, what we're offering. Uh, with that, I'm really eager to, uh, to introduce our guest, uh, Chancellor Richard Carranza, is the Chancellor of the New York City Public Schools, the largest school district in America, and obviously a school district in a part of the country that has had uh, unusual challenges as we've gone through this crisis. Uh, Chancellor Carranza, thanks so much for joining. Sel, so, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm really honored to be here. And I want to say hi to everybody. Uh, I'm sure many of our students are are watching as well because they they love what you do. So thank you for the invitation. No, no. And and so you know what I'm fascinated by is I would love, you know, what was going on in your life. You know, you are a New Yorker, and obviously you are you 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 you're the head of the largest school district, highly complex school district in the country. What was going on in your head, and what was it the end of March when? It was clear that we had a pandemic in the United States. It started to become clear that New York was getting hard hit and people were at least starting to surface the notion of school closures. What, what was going on in, in, in your mind? Well, we had been preparing for uh, that eventuality uh, back at end of February. Uh, and mm -hmm. one of the things that's pernicious about uh, this, this pandemic and this virus is that it's, it's, it's had so many iterations. It keeps on iterating and it looks different. Uh, but we were, we were trying to be prepared. So when uh, the decision was made on March 16th that we would transition to remote learning, uh, the one thing that we kept in mind was that school was not closing. We were going to continue learning, but it was just not going to be in a face-to-face -face environment. Uh, and that's why we said we've been in remote learning mode. Uh, ever since then, it's been just a matter of making sure that our teachers and our students and our families, quite honestly, because uh, caregivers, uh, parents, guardians, uh, grandmothers, neighbors, they've all kind of become new teachers as well uh, and supports for their students. So we're making sure that the entire organization is really pivoted to developing resources, providing resources and supporting students and families in remote learning. And I want to remind everyone, if you have questions for uh, Chancellor Carranza or myself, feel free to uh, post your questions on Facebook and YouTube, uh, where this is streaming, and we have team members who are going to be able to surface uh, questions to us. Uh, Chancellor Carranza, you know, in, those, in that, let's say, that week or two before that March 16th, when the schools close, you know, what, what, what was the... What was the order of operations? Uh, you know, there's so many schools, I think it's what, 1.2 million students you have. Uh, mm -hmm. How how did you all think about internet access? How did you think about, I know, school lunches, uh, special needs students? What was, how did you juggle all of that? So I, I, I have an incredible uh, team of folks that I work with that uh, had already started doing the logistical planning uh, around those issues. But obviously we were very concerned about, if you remember during that time period, uh, even the medical professionals were learning new things about how this uh, virus was promulgating itself in the community. Uh, so we were trying to stay up to date because school was still in session and following the advice of our medical experts, uh, we, were, we, were, we were very much into protocols about if there's a self-reported case, uh, if there's a confirmed case, what is the protocol? We shut down the school. How do we notify families? Uh, but as we became more and more apparent that we were going to go into remote learning, 
then uh, the, the focus was really about our most vulnerable students, students with disabilities, our multilingual learner students, our immigrant students, students in temporary housing, which is a term that we use in New York City for homeless students, uh, and all of all, all, all of our vulnerable populations. At the same time, we were also very concerned about the fact that, you know, New York City, almost 9 million residents in New York City, and it was very clear that the uh, emergency responders, uh, our medical personnel, our essential workers, uh, really depend on the schools for uh, their students to be taken care of. So we, at the same time, as we were planning how to transition to remote learning and shut the physical buildings down, we were also standing up over 150 what we call regional enrichment centers, rec sites, uh, all over the city of New York and every borough, specifically for the children of first responders, medical personnel, uh, essential workers, so that they would have, they could still continue to serve the residents of New York City and know that their children would be taken care of. That was a surreal experience because now you have uh, children in a school environment. So all of the social distancing and the face mask and the precaution and having 24 seven cleaning uh, happening all the time and how do you serve the food? All of those were the things that we were talking about and, and planning for. In addition, we know that 80, over 80% 80 of the students in New York City's public schools qualify for free and reduced lunch. So the, the poverty is real. Uh, we know that uh, many of our students get their meals at school. So at the same time, we planned for and stood up over 450 meal hubs uh, across the city in every borough where students could come get breakfast, lunch, and dinner all in one fell swoop. Uh, and then uh, about three weeks ago, we extended that to not only children, but uh, any resident can come to a meal hub and get all three meals as well. So we stood that up as well because we know that it's important for uh, for students and their, their parents not to go hungry. I'll tell you this, Sal, right now, since we transitioned March 16th, uh, we have served uh, almost nine and a half million meals uh, out of those food hubs. Uh, and we're, we're averaging right now a little over half a million uh, meals per day that are being distributed. Uh, and then we're also doing other things. Uh, we heard from some of our students that said, you know, during the school year, uh, we, we get uh, feminine hygiene products at our school for free and, and you know there's a need for that so we've started now distributing uh, feminine hygiene products at these meal hubs. Again, trying to be responsive to the needs of our community and making sure that uh, they're being taken care of. That's that's incredible. I can't even imagine the complexity of, of, of doing all of that so so quickly. And we have a lot of uh, comments coming in. You know, one just uh, from Facebook, David Wang says, thanks for taking care of the homeless and those who don't speak English. TL Quo from Facebook says, rec sites, fantastic idea. Uh, they're asking what it's like. You kind of described it already. You know, it, it seems like it's a hard, and I, I hadn't even thought about that dimension of the crisis <clears throat> until you just talked about it, that yes, you, these, these healthcare workers need uh, some, some type of support. There's a question here uh, from, from Leslie Eldergirl from YouTube. Uh, I work for the Bagwell College of Education in Georgia's Kennesaw State University. What can educator prep programs do to support what you believe will be the new norm, Chancellor Kranz? And I'll, I'll, I'll add a question. So there's the short term. How did you navigate that, where you had to go to whatever you want to call it, remote learning, distance learning, in fairly short order? What were the expectations? How did you do training? And then what do you think is, you know, to Leslie's question, what do you think is going to be the, the new normal if, if there is one? Great question. So thank you for both of those questions. So let me give some context. So when we decided that we would close schools, we were fortunate that we had uh, three days uh, to prepare for remote learning. And, and, and you, I'm, people are going to say, what do you mean you had three days? Well, in essence, we took a system of uh, over 150,000 teachers, 1.1 million students, and in a matter of three days, 72 hours, we completely transitioned to remote learning. Now, we know that many of our teachers were already uh, ex uh, experienced with and had done work with virtual learning, remote learning, online learning, blended environments, flipped classrooms, really incredible work here in New York City. But we also know that there was a, a modicum of our, of our teachers that had never had that experience. So it was a crash course, a boot camp, if you will, those three days to make sure that teachers had their devices, knew where to log in. We created something uh, in, in, our, um, in our department uh, 
learning management system called Teach Hub, where we've put links, the, a link to sell, the Khan Academies in there, uh, and lots of resources uh, for teachers to teach remotely from home. Um, so we, we stood that up, we did tr intensive training for those three days, and then we went into remote learning mode and the schools have been closed, except for the ones that are functioning for, as food hubs or these rec centers. Um, so for us, it was really making sure that the educators had what they needed. What was also important was to recognize that not all of our students had devices. So immediately for those three days, schools assigned the school-based uh, laptops and devices to their students, uh, again, prioritizing the most vulnerable students first, students that needed those devices. So students went home with those devices. There were about 175,000 of those devices. Uh, but what we immediately did as well is we worked with whoever could actually produce for us, and that happened to be Apple. So we put in order for 300,000 Wi-Fi enabled uh, iPads. Uh, and I'm happy to tell you, and we did a survey, and we had principals and teachers in contact with their students. They were giving us that information as to who needed devices. And remember, th these are 1,800 schools in New York City, so lots of information flowing to us. But I'm happy to report that as of uh, this week, we've now uh, delivered, shipped and delivered uh, over 290,000 devices uh, that are in the hands of our students right now. <clears throat> so short term versus long term. The short term is making sure that <clears throat> our students had those devices, making sure our teachers had the support that they needed to transition to remote learning. But the long term implications are vast and profound. And this gets to the question that, that came in as well about teaching programs. A crisis is always an opportunity to do something better. And we in education have lamented the digital divide for decades. This has forced us across the country to really take on the digital divide. And if there's any silver lining uh, with this pandemic is that when we get to the other side of this pandemic, uh, we will have bridged the digital divide in New York City. That's an amazing, amazing accomplishment. Uh, but I think it's an important accomplishment. Now, what that means is that teacher preparation programs, we're never going to go back to the way it was. So technology and being able to find resources and utilize resources in different ways, the ability using technology to personalize even more so the learning needs of students in a very individualized way. Uh, we're seeing that there's tremendous power right now in the hands of teachers to be able to do that. So if, if I was a professor in a teaching university preparing teachers, uh, I would be insisting that we have uh, lots of pedagogy for this flipped classroom, online teaching, uh, virtual teaching, that teachers have the wherewithal to be able to use Google Classroom or to be able to use a Zoom or to be able to use Microsoft Teams or WebEx uh, because it'll provide them with additional tools in their pedagogical toolkit uh, to be able to continue this trend that students will be uh, learning in, in virtual mode at least some segment of their of their day uh, and it provides us with a lot of other opportunities i'll give you just one more example sorry for going on and on but i'll give you no, one no, more this example is super interesting. <clears throat> so when you think about the fact that uh, in ap classes advanced placement classes <clears throat> in new york city excuse me in new york city um we, we with, with over 700 high schools uh, we have some very small high schools that may not have the ability to have an AP teacher for, let's just say, AP statistics. So what we piloted this year was uh, a, a virtual remote AP class, a bunch of AP classes. And the, and the notion was that if we have a very well-trained, very capable AP teacher, let's say in statistics, and they're at their school doing their job and doing a great job, but we know there's five other schools that have students at one, one, one student at one school, two students at another school, three at another. If we could set up that virtual classroom with that teacher providing AP instruction, and then those students remotely at those other schools are able to tap into that teacher uh, and get their AP instruction, would it work? Well, it was working gangbusters uh, before we went into remote learning. Guess what? 
that has provided us now with the opportunity to think about, okay, how do we leverage the real skill set that we have embedded in our teachers uh, and provide those learning opportunities to more and more students, especially in students in communities that have been historically underserved, and especially uh, in small uh, schools where you don't necessarily have a lot of teachers, but you, you still have students that want to have those experiences. Those are the kinds of experiences that I think uh, have presented themselves to us uh, as a response to this crisis. And I think that we, we have a, a responsibility not to lose momentum uh, once we get back to in-person learning. In-person learning will look different. No, and I love that last example because it really shows how there's an mm -hmm. there's a, maybe a silver lining that now these teachers are able to go beyond the confines of their individual classrooms. And it's kind of like a the whole district is serving the whole district, which is which is really, really powerful. Yeah. You know, tons of questions and comments from Facebook. Shelly Shelly Fox says, "Thank you uh, to the New York City IT device deployment team." Actually, relate to that. You know, you just kind of nonchalantly said, "Yeah, we deployed two hundred ninety thousand laptops, and we've essentially solved the digital divide." Exactly, how did that happen? Because we talked to a lot of districts. Obviously, to leverage Khan Academy, you need device access, uh, internet access. I am curious about the the broadband aspect of it. And then just how did you pull that off? Uh, you know, there's other superintendents who might listen to this and they would love to be able to emulate what you did. So um, I want to give tremendous kudos to our device deployment office as well, to our purchasing and procurement office, to, uh, to our mayor. Uh, so very early on when we knew that this, uh, the device issue was going to be an issue, uh, we immediately jumped uh, into uh, action mode and we contacted, we, we put out, um, calls to see who could actually uh, handle the volume that we were going to need. Uh, and Apple stepped right up and said, we, we will make sure that we, we get you what you need in record time. And they kept their word. We also worked with IBM that helped us with the installation of the Wi-Fi capability. Uh, then we worked with FedEx and UPS uh, to develop a protocol of how these would be shipped. Because obviously, if we're we were then under a stay-at-home order, uh, and we're trying to limit contact. The last thing you want to do is 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 having people come out to have to get their devices. So. Uh all of those partners were incredible at making sure that they prioritize getting these uh, devices into the hands of students. Uh, and then what we would also did is made sure that we had a, a way of surveying our students and our teachers to find those individuals that maybe hadn't raised their hand and said, I need a device so that we weren't leaving anything to chance. And as those devices started coming in, again, they were prioritized for our most vulnerable populations. We went from there and we expanded outward. Uh, we still have devices so that if, you know, in, there may be a case where a student had their own device and now it's broken, they can request one and, and we'll ship it right to them. Um, it was a massive undertaking, uh, but we have some incredible colleagues here in the Department of Education that just jumped right into action. Uh, one of the things that we also did with these devices <clears throat> is that we didn't want any family to feel that they couldn't request a device because what if it breaks am i responsible for it you know i i'm not working what what so what we did is every device comes uh, right out of the box it comes with wi-fi enabled it, they get a hard case with it uh, and we also purchased insurance for every single device so our students and parents don't have to wor worry if something happens uh, we want them to have the device as well and, you know, it's, it's sometimes in New York, we, we sometimes get a little blasé about the size of, of the numbers. Uh, but you're right, 290,000 devices. It's as if, you know, you took Seattle and you took, uh, uh, I think it was Seattle, Detroit, San Francisco and Boston and put them all together. And we just provided all of those systems with devices. That's kind of what the team was able to do uh, in pretty, pretty record time. And how are you all tackling, I mean, that's amazing, first of all. And, and how are you tackling the, the broadband issue? Have the telecom carriers helped out there? Yes, yeah, so our, our, our telecom providers have been great. They've uh, really stepped up and uh, uh, provided Wi-Fi access uh, for our students, uh, especially our students that live in temporary housing or our students that are in our uh, 
our uh, public housing uh, units. They, that, that was the first place that they went in and made sure that there was uh, Wi-Fi available. We are in discussion with them now. Um, obviously, when we first went into remote learning mode, which was in March, the plan was that we would come back to face-to-face -face learning in April. Uh, well, that, obviously that, that didn't happen. We've, we're finishing the academic year uh, through June in remote learning. Summer learning will be on, in remote learning mode as well. Uh, and as I've mentioned, our goal is to be back person to person learning and in person learning uh, September. But again, the medical uh, medical experts are going to are going to dictate how fast we come into in person learning. So I have the entire organization focused on uh, remote learning through the rest of this calendar year, just to be prepared. Um, so the, the, we are in conversations now with uh, uh, all the carriers about extending that Wi-Fi access and looking at what that would look like. But I have to say that uh, in times of crisis, you really see the true nature uh, of individuals and organizations. And I just cannot say enough about uh, what our uh, Wi-Fi providers have done about, uh, I've mentioned some of the, the shipping companies, I've mentioned uh, some of the technology companies, but a lot of uh, partners that, ha that provide online resources and online uh, um, um, materials have really stepped up in a very unprecedented way to support uh, our children. And, and, and I like to say to them, thank you, because without their assistance, uh, I know that we would not be uh, as successful with it as as I think we are. There's a lot of work to do. We're definitely building the plane as we fly the plane, uh, but we couldn't have done it without these uh, partners uh, and, and businesses. So I just want to give them a big public shout out and thank you. No, definitely. I, you know, what you just described over the last five, that's, that's one of the best stories I've heard, frankly, in the last couple of weeks. Uh, and obviously I've had a lot of conversations with folks about the digital divide and device access. And uh, that's really gives me hope for where we can go. And, and to your point, not just through this crisis, but post crisis, hopefully, you know, the digital divide will be a smaller divide or hopefully even get solved. You know, you touched on summer and back to school. How do you think summer is going to be different this year? You know, historically things like summer programs would be for a subset of kids, maybe the kids who might have fallen behind a bit. Do you think it's going to be, you know, is, is it going to be, hey, everyone needs to just keep learning through the summer? Well, I think one thing I don't think we speak enough about and it's critically important is that uh, the children and everyone in New York City, but everyone in the in the world and definitely in the United States, you know, New York City was the epicenter of the epicenter in the United States, which was New York State. Uh, so we were in the epicenter of the epicenter. We've been hit hard. We've we've uh, lost uh, colleagues. We everybody knows somebody that has been lost due, due to this uh, coronavirus nineteen. Um, so we can't forget the trauma that our students and our staff and our community has undergone. It's a traumatic event. Uh, and and uh, we are starting to see some of the signs uh, of the trauma, you know, with students and, and students not being able to sleep. Uh, so uh, I, I saw this also when I was superintendent in Houston and, and we were hit by Hurricane Harvey. And, and I remember seeing the manifestation of trauma and how that affected people in different ways. And same thing is happening with this. So as much as I want students to continue to learn and always to be learning, I also think that in the first opportunity that we have for students to just breathe, uh, that's going to be good. We've embedded social emotional learning, trauma-informed curriculum, trauma-informed supports uh, in all of the uh, materials and all of the resources that we've provided for teachers. We also have a parent hub where parents have all of the, not all of them, but they have a lot of resources that they can use uh, to work with their students, their children, uh, and help support their children as they work through it. And they can work through it as well. But uh, I think that the trauma-informed approach is going to be critically important as we come back to uh, in-person learning. As a result of that, um, I also think that uh, summer, uh, we're going to prioritize uh, our vulnerable students. Obviously, students with disabilities uh, will be prioritized over the summer. Uh, we've had uh, remote learning plans for every one of our students with disabilities uh, that ad has adapted their individual education plan for a remote learning environment. Um, we also instituted through a lot of feedback, but we instituted a new grading policy. You can't 
you have new attendance policy as well. You can't shove the old attendance policy into a remote learning environment. It just wouldn't work. Uh, so we have a new attendance policy. We also have a grading policy. And in, in, in essence, uh, students are continuing to work. They're continuing to turn in assignments. Uh, but uh, instead of failing, no, no student's going to get a failure at the end of this academic year. What they'll get is an in-progress grade. And what the in-progress grade signifies is that they have a little bit more work to do to finish the requirements of the class or finish the requirements of the grade, you know, third grade or fourth grade. And then those students will be prioritized for summer learning in the remote learning environment as well. Uh, and the whole point is to give students more time. Uh, and even there, I would just say this. Uh, the goal as an educator for me has always been that students master the the subject matter, that, that they get mastery. Uh, I'm not necessarily wanting students to go for the A, the B, the C, or the I want them to master what <clears throat> they're trying to learn. So this has forced us now to really embrace this notion of mastery learning. So if the student hasn't mastered that subject matter, they're not going to get a failure. They're going to get in progress, and that says, you have some more work to do, we have some more work to do to support you because the goal is that not that you finish first, but that you finish. Uh, and, and, and that again is changing the narrative for uh, how we look at and, and how we give weight to what grades really are. Um, so anyway, that's how we're prioritizing for summer learning. Uh, and I'll tell you that uh, many of the orga organizations and institutions in New York City, the, the museums, the park and rec department, uh, uh, the libraries are really working with us to be able to create, even if it's some virtual experiences that students can have over the summer as well. So it's not just reading, writing, and arithmetic, but they also have some other experiential experiences that they can engage in, even if it's in a virtual way over the summer. Wow. And, and just so you know, you're getting a lot of uh, praise on social media. Uh, Peggy uh, says, Chancellor Carranza, what a great leader, really getting this from every angle. It's rare to find people with these abilities. And I think we can all sense the authenticity. You. Uh, you know, we have a little bit of time left. You know, what, what do you see as the scenarios for back to school? Obviously, there's the two extremes where stay, we stay fully remote or we go completely back to normal. But what, what are the other scenarios that you're contemplating? And, and how do you think things might be changed forever because of this? Well, um, again, we're always going to be driven by what the medical experts tell us. So we're going to we're going to listen to the science. Uh, as a parent, I would not want my child to go back to a school environment unless I was confident that my child was going to be safe, secure, and not infected. So there's a number of things that are beyond our control as as uh, as educators and my control as a chancellor. And 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 so we're going to listen to the medical experts and make sure that we have the protocols. And, and the materials, the testing that we need, and the the, the precaution, the, the precautionary uh, gear that we'll need as well. But we've actually been modeling a number of scenarios. Uh, I'll, I'll just give you an example of a couple. Uh, and these are by no means, uh, uh, do I mean to say this is exactly what's going to happen. Uh, it's going to be driven by whatever the circumstances are at the time that the decision has to be made uh, about going back to in-person learning or not. But I'll give you an example. Uh, so when we come back, it's pretty obvious that we're going to have to probably still practice social distancing. How do you practice social distancing in the very, very tight-knit, tight quarters that are New York City's public schools? We're a very compact city. Uh, so almost 9 million residents, how do you do that in, in our schools? Well, so if you have an elementary school, for example, does that mean then that you have shifts? So you have an early morning shift and part of your students comes in the early morning and then you have an afternoon shift and the other half of the students come to that to that uh, that part of the, the learning. And then how do you split teacher schedules to cover both shifts? Uh, that could be one thing. Uh, or do you do uh, something where it becomes a little bit more of a, of a remote learning? So for example, you take that same elementary school and you do a cohort model. So you have, mm -hmm. you take all of the students, you have cohort one, two, and three. Cohort one goes to school while cohorts two and three practice remote learning on Monday. On Tuesday, cohort two goes to school. Well, mm. uh, cohorts one and three are remote learning. On Wednesday, cohort three goes to school. Well, one and two are practicing remote learning. Uh, 
that's only because you want to provide the distance to, to do social distancing. Uh, what, would that, what will that look like? We know that the CDC has talked about, uh, as part of what their recommendations are, is that students don't congregate in lunchrooms when, whenever they get back to in-person learning, that they'll eat their lunch uh, in, and their breakfast in the classroom. So what does that look like then? And how do you deliver it? How do you serve it? How do you clean up after it? Uh, what does the day look like then? Uh, what do buildings look like? Are there buildings that we just are not gonna be able to use because they're just physically not uh, equipped to handle the social distancing that may be required. Uh, all of those questions and a myriad of other questions are things that right now we're grappling with and modeling to see how that would look like. But it gives you a little insight to the complexities that all educators and all of my colleagues that are systems leaders are really grappling right now with. Uh, because and, and we're doing it in an environment that we don't know what the ground floor is gonna look like when we get to June and July and August, we, we, we just don't know. Uh, I'll give you one other example of how the, the ground is shifting right beneath our, our feet. Uh, two weeks ago, nobody was talking about uh, PMIS, which is a pediatric multi-system uh, syndrome, which uh, resembles oh, yeah. Kawasaki disease. Yeah. Yeah. Students, uh, children are getting very, very sick. In New York City, we have over 100 students that are being treated for that, that syndrome syndrome and and uh, we know that doctors are exploring is is there a relationship between COVID-19 exposure and then the, this syndrome uh, two weeks ago we weren't even talking about that so that's how rapidly this is manifesting and, and iterating uh, this this virus is iterating so the sand is definitely shifting beneath our feet so what we're trying to do is to model a number of scenarios and be prepared so for what so Whatever those circumstances are, we can pivot very quickly to a model, or at least we've thought about what some of these implications would be as we make those decisions to go back into in-person learning. Wow. Well, Chancellor Carranza, you know, given all of that you've done, I mean, one, it's heartening, as I said, there's a lot of good news embedded in obviously the larger, not so good context that we are all dealing with, especially that y'all are dealing with in New York. But I think, you know, I speak for everyone watching that, you know, keep doing the amazing work that you and your team are doing. Uh, you know, it gives confidence in folks to see leadership like what you're providing. And I'm honored, frankly, uh, that, you, you know, you're able to make a little bit of time for us today, because I can imagine there's many, many things going on in your life world. So thank you so much for, for joining us. And I hope we can do this in, again in, in a few weeks. I would love to do it. And thank you for the invitation. And to everybody that's out there watching, listening, stay safe, take care of each other. This is a time for us to take care of each other. So thank you for the opportunity and be safe. Thank you. Well, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, I hope you were as inspired as I was. Uh, you know, I think it's in times of stress and times of crisis that, you know, people show their, show their true colors. And I think, you know, you're seeing examples of really great leadership from Richard, from Chancellor Carranza and from many others that we've had. And, uh, and, and it's, it's heartening to see how folks have been stepping up to, to do the right thing. Um, look forward to uh, joining you on future live streams. Uh, I will see all of y'all tomorrow. Uh, stay safe and stay healthy, just like Chancellor Carranza told us.